so good morning, good day, good evening to all. Uh, I'd like to start out uh, by thanking all the organizers, other presenters, and attendees. This has been a, a really great conference so far. We're so glad to be a part of it. Um, so yeah, so I'm coming to you from the American Philosophical Society. Uh, it's an independent research library and museum founded by Benjamin Franklin, 1743, located uh, right in the heart of Philadelphia, PA. Uh, there I work alongside my colleague, Cynthia Heider, at the Center for Digital Scholarship. So uh, back in 2015, uh, the center launched an open data initiative. Under this initiative, we actively identify content in our library conducive to being reconfigured as data sets and encourage the use and reuse of the data by opening up and easing access to all. We believe this offers users uh, unprecedented access to digital objects as it not only opens access to the image, but also to the text within the image. But while opening up historical documents to computational analysis does permit these additional levels of access, some data sets we found present more challenges than other, uh, particularly when that data represents the human experience quantitatively. For example, uh, our first open historic data project used early intake records from the Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, Eastern State's a prison located in Philadelphia, best known for refining the system of solitary confinement. As you can see here on this slide, it's very detailed data, right? It includes each prisoner's name, gender, race, sentencing length, crimes committed, and, and much more. Uh, we were and, and remain excited about the potential uses of this data. Uh, but after the project, we started to think about, you know, what it actually means to open this data up to the public. After all, you know, we're talking about the lives of human beings, snapshots of people under great duress, and it's information captured by someone who holds a significant amount of power over them. Uh, furthermore, uh, they never consented to this data being put out there, nor were they aware that it would one day end up in archives like ours. You know, and with our final project, you know, as you can see here, we included this statement about it on our site. Um, but is a well-intentioned statement buried in the credits of an exhibit enough? Uh, me and my colleagues no longer think so. So now the big question is, how can we uh, encourage the reuse of this data in a way that doesn't reinforce cultural and structural harms, biases, and inequality? And, and the answer, to be honest, is we don't really know, but we're working on it. Uh, you know, on the one hand, this data is great for producing new scholarship and facilitating conversation. But on the other, the data does have the potential to be used for the wrong reasons, such as the nature of data and of archives in general. Um, so for our next project, we thought an imperative to explore this question. And it's kind of the perfect project to use as a test case for how you treat sensitive data. As seen here, uh, the indenture book is a, like a massive tome of over 5,000 indenture records taken from the Port of Philadelphia from 1771 to 1773. Each entry consists of uh, the indentured person's name, country of origin, length of contract, who they're indentured to, the debt owed, details of their profession, and the terms of the indenture. So like the Eastern State data, these records are quite detailed. They can tell us a lot about the past, but since we're talking about human beings, they're also extremely sensitive. Uh, and I should say, while this big book of data it only covers a three-year period, it does have the potential to tell thousands of stories and reveal new knowledge about migration, labor, and exploitation. Uh, the project grew out of a series of collaborations. Uh, back in 2017, a summer internship uh, with our summer intern, uh, Ben Weinstein, yielded the digitization and early transcription. But during this time, we realized that the book was missing uh, roughly 10 pages, uh, but lucky at that time, we also discovered a widely circulated transcription of the book that included those missing pages. Uh, alas, that transcription was less than ideal since the transcriber left out a significant amount of information. But it was a start, and so we went from there. Uh, fast forward to 2018, we put out a call for uh, one of our DH fellowships and offered the Indenture Project as an example for a potential collaboration. Uh, little did we know that someone would take us up on it. Uh, Nicole Meehan uh, joined us from the University of St. Andrews for a month of pretty intense collaboration in June of 2019, has been working with us remotely from Scotland ever since. So in October of 2020, uh, we were pleased to launch Investigating Indentured Servitude. It's an interactive exhibit that uses visualization, data stories, and archival resources uh, to explore uh, the indentured data. Many of these individuals recorded in the records have been lost to history. Uh, we're hoping that this resource will open the path for their stories to be told. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Nicole and Cynthia to discuss uh, a little bit about our process and some of the decisions that we made along the way. Nicole. Thank you, Byard. 
Um, so hi, I'm Nicole Mahan. I'm joining you from uh, Scotland. Um, I'm based at the University of St Andrews. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of uh, reflexive practice that we developed as collaborators around this project. Um, so as Bayard said, it was really well underway when I arrived at the Centre for Digital Scholarship to take up the short term Digital Humanities Fellow. I applied to that grant programme um, with the hope of working with this specific data set and I really wanted to help to create an online exhibition composed of data visualizations contextualized by the digital archival holdings from the APS and other institutions. But as so often happens, it was really the process of working with the data rather than the outcome itself um, that was most valuable to me as a researcher. It quickly became apparent um, through looking at the, the book, the data set, and in uh, conversation with Bayard and Cynthia, that the data uh, presented in a certain way it means that we have to make decisions about it and those whose story it has the potential to tell. So as collaborators, we really tried to develop this reflexive approach to the conundrum of um, telling and presenting data in specific ways. And we really wanted to commit to transparency. Um, and that's something that Cynthia will talk about in a minute. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Bayard. So inscribed in each entry of the records of indenture is the single, is, is one single moment in the life of an individual. It's a fleeting but pivotal, pivotal and really arguably intense moment in um, their life. It's an extremely difficult moment. And we really want to represent this as faithfully as possible. It's a responsibility that we took really seriously as a project team. So we began with each record themselves. So just to illustrate, um, as Bayard has already kind of discussed, the information contained in these records can be seen in this uh, photograph. And this is the record um, of one of 5,000 plus people in this book, uh, Catherine Beesman. So you can read um, here under the date on the left hand side, her name. And this brings us to the first kind of inherently problematic de decision that we had to take here. We wanted to analyze the gendered treatment of indentured servants and redemptioners. And though in the record, we don't actually know the gender, we had to discern it from the name. That's obviously a really difficult thing to do. It's a troubled pursuit for many reasons, um, not least because it forces the inhabitants into um, the inhabitants of the records into a binary that they may not have identified. We can also see in this record that um, Catherine was indentured in Germantown in Philadelphia. And in our exhibition, we also wanted to present location-based visualizations and maps. Many of the locations um, here, as you can see on the map, um, did not map historically onto contemporary maps. So there is a, a lack of veracity here and a location creep, and we did have to accept that and document it in the exhibit. And then after processing and refining our data sets, we turned to thinking about interpretation and display and the decisions that we would make about representing these individuals. And again, we uh, adopted this reflexive, collaborative and open practice as we discussed how best to help our audience connect with these thousands of records and the visualizations um, that represented them. And we agreed that we would use uh, specific lenses through which to analyze this data. Uh, time, gender and location, which would allow us to focus in on the records, identify three individuals in which we could tell the stories of. So we moved from a kind of macro to micro view, and that we hoped would emphasize that the datification of individual lives uh, creates distance between the viewer and the subject, and it does remove a certain amount of emotion, precluding the full understanding of the data set. So we would show that in the macro view, and we would zoom in to the micro where we would really tell the emotive story of these individuals as much as possible. If I could have the next slide, please, Bayard. And so returning to the story of uh, Catherine Beesman, whose record we, we have just seen, um, this is not the only record in um, the indenture book that related to Catherine. On further examination of the data set, we found that on August the 1st, uh, 1772, Catherine Beesman was indentured as a servant to James Smith, 
And that was a contract that turned out to be a continuation of an initial agreement signed on September the 17th, 1771 with George Michael Kraft. And our analysis of the data set and the length of the typical contracts shows this to be a very long time. Typical contracts would be between four and six years and the length of Catherine's contract was 26 years. Digging further into this, uh, uncovered mention of Catherine in another data set and we learned that she had previously resided in the Philadelphia Alms House, um, as you can see in the image here. The record there described Catherine as a mulatto, a term used in the 18th century for a person of mixed race and one that eliminates the inherently racialized structure of society at that time. Catherine was later transferred back to Craft, and she then moved to the Northern Liberties of Philadelphia to learn housewifery, to read in the Bible, and to write a legible hand and to sew plain work. Unfortunately, we can't find anything more about Catherine, but we can read about this small part of her life. And this does personalize the data set and allow us to appreciate a fraction of the emotion contained in its pages. We can understand, therefore, that the visualizations remove us from the reality of their lived experience. And in the exhibition that we've currently put together, we do have three individuals that we hope represent um, this issue um, and personalize those data. So we'd have the next slide, please. So we did ask for visitor feedback um, through this mechanism, um, where if you click on a, a page on the exhibition, you're taken to a Google form where you can provide feedback. So the personal circumstances of Catherine Beesman highlight the imperative for awareness of the context, both historic and contemporary, within which exhibitions operate. Catherine was a victim of distinct racial prejudice, yet it would be a false equivalence to state that slavery and indentured servitude were similar. And this is something we're very conscious of in the exhibition. So when we asked for feedback, we were um, delighted to receive um, from a few responses um, that our visitors have learned something new, and in particular, um, that they understand the differences uh, between enslavement and endangered servitude, um, and also more about the role of women in colonial America, which we were um, very hopeful um, to promote. And happily, almost 70% of the respondents have said that interacting with the exhibition has changed the way that they think about colonial America. I'll now pass you over to Cynthia, who is going to say more about data ethics. Unmute myself. Hi, I'm Cynthia Heider. Uh, as uh, Bayard introduced me earlier as well, I work at the American Philosophical Society Center for Digital Scholarship. Um, and I only have a couple minutes, so I'm going to kind of uh, zoom through if I can. Uh, but so basically, I'm just, I'd like to make, um, yeah, just talk a little bit about the interaction between, we know that an interaction with an object from the past has the potential to change the way that someone in the present thinks about their world. And so that's a given. Right, the APS has built its stewardship policies around this relationship model where it retains custody of an object and, and protects it, controls outside contact that's believed to infect, uh, affect the item's integrity, longevity, or value. And the APS has, has stewarded, stewarded this book uh, in that particular way since 1835. But the work that we do with the Center for Digital Scholarship is meant to increase contact with these items. And that extends the act of stewardship from the object or even its digital surrogate to the information that contains in the form of the structured data sets that we release. Um, and so there, that is actually a great point because this is where the stewardship book, the rule book goes out of the window. We have to ask ourselves questions like, does contact with the information itself affect the integrity, value, or authenticity like it could with the physical object? Or what does stewardship even mean in this context? So I love that we had the chance to think deeply about these things and produce a project and more importantly, a process that reflects a commitment to openness and access on the people, uh, the part of the people actually doing the work and a respect for the people whose lives are depicted in the volume. And it's really, in, you know, it's, I'm really grateful that we were able to move that object interaction movement in, a moment into the digital space. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, a lot of our process has involved reimagining this this uh, custodial idea of stewardship um, as something that goes beyond the directive of keeping. So the APS holds the physical object, we promote the use of the material, we host the data, but there's another aspect of stewardship that involves care. Um, and so we've really forefronted in our process with this project, our responsibility to take care. 
Um, and I mean that in several different ways. So firstly, um, there is a saying in computer science that um, if you have garbage in, you have garbage out, meaning that your input um, can, your output can only be as good as your input. Um, and I think that that contributes uh, to our process actually. It, I mean, this is, this is an extension of that principle to team working conditions. The product will be better for both producers and consumers when colleagues can communicate well, are transparent and generous, demonstrate flexibility and value accountability in order to produce something that is thoughtfully and responsibly humanistic in the end. Um, the second aspect of that is that um, when you are honest and transparent and critically engaged in your collaborative project, um, uh, you're better able to see the uncertainties, biases, and other limitations that are actually present in the source itself um, and address them. Um, and thirdly, our accountability does not end with the release of the data. So we uh, are responsible as well in stewarding this information so that we can um, care for our audiences, essentially. So data is made of bodies in the word of Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren uh, Klein, and our role as stewards of, of this sensitive data means that in addition to protecting the data at hand from losing its integrity and value, we also have the responsibility of anticipating the damage that the data could do from beyond the grave. Um, so, you know, that means that risk assessment has to happen early in the project. Um, there are reasons that we chose to do this indenture book. It's actually part of it is that um, the 1907 transcription was already out there and being used by genealogists. And so it seemed like a better option to provide a more complete um, and accurate version uh, to people that could actually, you know, use this in a, in a careful uh, manner. Uh, next slide, please. And so that's great that we, we went about it in this way because our institution is actually changing. And, um, you know, that happens all the time. But one of the changes has been the merger of the American Philosophical Society and the David Library, which is a longstanding research library dedicated to the study of the American Revolution, which has been a popular venue for genealogists and people that do family research along with other scholars. And so we have this new audience. And with that comes a chance for still more people to be able to use and connect with the data and the website, bring a new perspective to us and more feedback, we hope, at least. Um, and so next slide, please. And so moving forward, um, as with all of our open data products, this project is ongoing. And so we've been, in use, we've been engaging users through data visualization and genealogical workshops, which have demonstrated an enthusiastic response to the data and website. Um, we're in the process of planning several uh, symposium and hopefully symposia and hopefully um, events where people can use the data themselves. Um, and we're moving forward and we hope that you'll join us. Um, and we're also, we're always looking for feedback. So if you have a second, please take a look at the site, fill out our short survey at the end. Um, and here's our contact information. If you have any questions, I had some other things I wanted to say and I didn't. Uh, so <laughs> please contact us.